Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, December 13th, 2022 City of Gallatin Council Committee meeting. Thank you for being here tonight online and here. And uh, uh, we're ready for the roll call, Ms. Kitchell. Vice Mayor Fennell. Here. Councilman Alexander. Here. Councilman Fan. Here. Councilwoman George. Here. Councilman Hayes is absent. And Councilwoman Love. Here. And Councilman Over is Overton is absent, but we do have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Kittrell. Uh, let's move on to our public recognition. We don't have any uh, uh, minutes to approve, so I'll move from there. Uh, we do have public recognition for anyone who would like to address this committee. Uh, you have five minutes to discuss anything that's on the agenda. My name is Shirley Camp, and I live at 118 Wayne Street, and I'm here to speak about the Laurel Wood Project. Um, my question first is, why does every spot of land need to be covered by a building? I know, taxes and somebody will make money. But what about the wildlife and the clean air for us to breathe? In the area where Laurel Wood is proposed, it's already a high traffic area getting out on Southwater or 109. Even with the proposed traffic light, you might not be able to get into the line of traffic because it's backed up a lot of the times to almost our street. So even more important, what about emergency vehicles? How are they gonna get there and get in and out? Because it's difficult now. And with pro the proposed amount of buildings that they wanna put in that area, I'm, I'm understanding it's going to put increase the traffic as much as 700 units a day up and down those two streets. So um, I'm just asking you to think about, would you want that where you live? And let's apply the golden rule. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kemp. Good evening. My name is Leslie Smith, and my husband Rick Smith and I live at 109 Hicks Lane. And some of you may recognize my name because last Thursday I sent you an email about the annexation of the 77 and a half acres um, located east of Dobbins Pike and north of Hicks Lane, otherwise known as the Myers Hill development. And I won't belabor my time up here with all of the details of the email that I sent you, but I would like to highlight some of those. I would first like to talk about Hicks Lane and just the condition of the lane. And I did bring the, the pictures that I also attached to the email. May I present this to the committee? The pictures that I've just presented to you indicate um, the disrepair of Hicks Lane. First of all, Hicks Lane is a very narrow 15 foot wide lane. And um, those pictures will show you uh, crumbling asphalt as well as tire ruts for all the tires, the cars that have to leave the road just to be able to pass oncoming traffic as well as the turnaround where the, the buses go when they are turning to go to Schaefer Middle School right down the road there. We have lots of potholes and those potholes are pretty much year round. They do occasionally patch those holes, but oftentimes that does not stay for very long because of the amount of traffic that goes up and down that lane right now as it is. Any additional traffic that would be caused from a new subdivision there would make that road absolutely impassable. It also is an extremely hazardous road just because of the width of it. And it's very hilly and I know that there is at least one hill where you have to be almost right on top of it before you will see oncoming traffic. And the traffic appears to be in the middle of the road because it is so narrow. 
I've heard others on, on the road, others neighbors say that the buses, when they pass each other, they've actually hit their mirrors because they are so close. We also have a lot of students who um, walk that road after ball practice throughout the, the fall and winter months. And you know, as you can see right now, it's dark. And so after, after practice, they're walking home along that lane in the dark. And it, it's just an extremely, extremely dangerous road. Now, we've been told that there's going to be just an emergency exit onto Hicks Lane from the subdivision. However, I think we all know that if it's a shortcut, people are gonna use it. It's not something that's going to prevent people from going in and out through that route if they feel it's going to give them a shortcut out of the neighborhood. Plus, the number of additional students that would feed into the schools there. The schools are already at or near capacity and um, just even if people do not use the emergency exit to get down to that school, they will use Hicks Lane. Many times the school buses use Hicks Lane as opposed to going up to the top of the hill to Union School Road because that road gets so backed up with people going in and out from uh, Bill's Elementary School that that traffic can back up all the way down to Hicks Lane. We also heard la at the last session that they are planning on widening Dobbins Pike, but that would be down in front of the subdivision so that people can turn in and out of the subdivision. It will not impact the traffic backup that already occurs right now. So I believe, my husband believes also that the original vote of no for the annexation of this property was the correct one. And we respectfully ask that you again vote no on this annexation. Good evening, Mayor Brown and Galveston City Council. Thank you for allowing us to have public recognition tonight. My name is Joanne Bates. I live at 120 Hicks Lane along with my husband on land that's been in our property and been in our family for over 100 years. We're a farm family. We farm in the community and the county and therefore have a great affection for and strive to serve as good stewards of the land. The request to annex and ultimately rezone the property known as the Mears, Lane, Mears Hill Development is not good stewardship of this property. We're opposed to what's being discussed at the work session tonight, the request to override, to overturn, to change what your planning commission discussed, evaluated, and voted on, and voted no to recommend approval in July, on July 25th of this year. From a previous attempt, we know that the applicant and the owner want to put 193 houses on 77 and a half acres that's, if I do my math right, and I'm not real good in math, two and a half houses per acre, and that's going to cover the, the land in cement and concrete. It reminds me of this song, if you're old enough to remember Joni Mitchell, they paved paradise and put up a parking lot. In a document that was posted online, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, um, somebody wrote, this will not affect landowners. Well, they didn't ask me and my husband. For you see, we're going to have 18 to 20 backyards adjoining our property. We respectfully request that you adhere to your planning commission's decision when it comes to a vote. Our reason to deny annexation and ultimately to rezone is this is spot annexation in the middle of county property. If you want a visual, a donut hole. If it's rezoned and that's the purpose of getting it annexed, it'd be spot zoning. The immediate area around this area is zoned R40 and R15. If you put a donut hole of R8 in the middle of it, to me, that's spot zoning. In addition, she's spoken about the uh, traffic on the lane. It's one lane, it's narrow, it has no marked center line, and on any given day from the 1st of August until May 15, school buses run up and down that lane in the morning and again in the afternoon. They serve Benny Bills Elementary and Schaefer Middle. 
I'm told in conversation with the Sumner County Transportation Department that they sometimes make more than one trip because it takes multiple routes because we don't have enough bus drivers. Additionally, it's used as a shortcut between Dobbins Pike and the eastern end of Albert Gallatin. I watched that this afternoon. I just happened to be in the back, looked out my window. Shortcuts, people picking up kids, buses, quite interesting. The proposed plan, as Ms. Smith uh, uh, talked about, shows all the traffic exiting onto Dobbins Pike. Well, there's an emergency exit at the far end of Dobbins Pike. Well, that's going to be interesting because <clears throat> we already have traffic that's there on Patent Track Extension, which, by the way, thank you for. That's made our life a little bit easier. But it comes to a standstill in the morning, and it comes to a standstill in the afternoon. We do get two months of the year, June and July, that we can approach the intersection of Albert Gallatin and Northwater without tremendous congestion in the morning and then in the afternoon. But please, before you vote, come visit our area and see what we're talking about. This emergency exit is gonna be exiting into Schaefer Middle School property. I don't know what the Board of Education will have to say about that, but they have an enrollment of 650 students, approximately 60 staff members that are transported daily to that area. And Benny Bills has approximately 70 students with 69, 700 students with 69 plus staff. Those numbers were at the beginning of the year when we talked in July. That's a total of 1,350 students and 195 plus adults that enter and leave a central spot every day, transported in, transported out. These, stu these students don't have cars. Like when I taught at the high school and you had to, you were concerned with student drivers and traffic. Everybody's got to be transported. The proposed development is going to be for 193 homes. You, the city, are going to have to provide water, upgrading the water line to a 12-inch line, gas, electricity, sewer, a safe and peaceful environment, garbage pickup, roads, fire protection. According to the work session agenda on one page, the police department has already told you they're going to need additional police to monitor that area. I can see other departments requesting money for things. I understand why they want to spend the city's money, in the county where this property is, the requirement is you can have five acres and build one structure. But should you, that's my five minutes, should you have more than five acres, you've got to have two septic tank sites. Hey, show us some of Gallatin's true grit, show us some amazing grace, and continue with what your planning commission said to do. No approval. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bates. I'm Tina Tobin, 462 Gibbs Lane. Good evening, Council and Mayor. Um, I'm also looking to speak about Hicks Lane. Um, I don't want to repeat everything, um, but I know we've talked about the road. And I'd also like to just mention that Dobbins Pike cannot accommodate more traffic. I mean, we have, it's a fast road. We have so many blind hills. At Gibbs Lane, we just had a fatal accident not that long ago at Dobbins Pike, and the thought of adding more traffic on that, I just cannot imagine. Um, 193 houses, that's an awful lot of extra cars on Dobbins Pike. So please, I agree that the original decision was correct, and please don't add that traffic. Thank you. Tobin? I am David A.G. My wife and I live at 129 Hicks Lane, and uh, you, we have lived there for 28 years or so. And, uh, you, you know, it's a nice, peaceful community. We want to keep it that way. I, I, with all of this development and stuff and all, I mean, you're going to have more increased traffic. You're going to have also, we're going to have uh, more crime. We're going to have more litter uh, and, and, and other things and all. And plus, uh, one thing you're going to do also is you're going to take in the habitat that's in our area. Where are they going to go? I mean, I mean, you, you know, you're 
with the development at the end of Albert Galton Road and the, the development on Hicks Lane and all, where, where, where is these animals going to go? I mean, you, you're going to put them in harm's way with all this building and construction and everything that's that's going on, and uh, yeah, they would have no place to go. And, uh, you, you know, you're going to take a, a peaceful, quiet community and disrupt it with all this uh, traffic and, and this development, you know, with it being built, there's going to be homes and stuff there that's going to have two to three vehicles per family. I mean, just look at the traffic that's just going to be more congested, especially, you, you know, at the red light up there by the funeral home, the shell station and all, and, you know, people going in and out of school. And, uh, you, you know, it's going to be a nightmare. If there's an emergency out there, I mean, look at the response time during this peak traffic times. How it's going to delay them getting to an emergency. I mean, you, you know, it's just going to be more of a headache and it's going to be more of a disruption to our way of life there. And I mean, it's, uh, I would like for y'all to take and vote no like you did last time. Uh, this this is just way too much for uh, us to be have put on us. And plus, I mean, with the city infrastructure, the way that it is now and all, I really don't think that you can handle it. I mean, you, you know, with the, uh, the not enough police uh, and uh, not enough fire people and, and uh, you, you know, and it's, it's just going to be a, a major problem. I want y'all to use foresight, not hindsight. It, I mean, you, you got to put a little bit more thinking and planning into what we're doing in this beautiful city, into our beautiful area. There is nothing that is gracious and growing about Galton now. I mean, if you take a look at all of the areas in our great city, all you see is congestion, traffic problems everywhere. And it's just what it, all these developments that's going to do is just create more havoc and for people and, and, and especially more havoc for the environment. And, you know, I would think, I would appreciate it if y'all would think about it and take into consideration and vote <clears throat> no again on this matter. Thank you. Madam Mayor, Council, my name is Joe Johnson. I live with my girlfriend at 170 Dobbins and own 168 Dobbins also. My concern is the traffic, and by the way, I'm a recovering stroke. It, I had a stroke in October and recovering right now and have multiple doctor appointments. And getting out on Dobbins Pike at this particular time is bad. I can only imagine what it will be if they put it, if you vote yes on this and overturn it, what the traffic will be. And another question, other questions I have uh, concerning my property. Uh, one is what will that do to the uh, our zoning, if they get that zone, I know she talked about the donut hole and what have you. Will that con will we be grandfathered in as county residents or will we be zoned into the city? And also, the infrastructure that would have to be put in, where are they going to put it in? Down Dobbins Pike? It's already so congested you can't get in and out of your driveway. If they put the infrastructure down through that, it's going to put Dobbins Pike at one lane for part of the time. And it will be impossible for us to do anything, get in and out of your property. I please ask on behalf of all of us that are in that area to vote no again. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And everything I hope will go our way. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson.
Evening all. Good evening, Chairwoman, Mayor, Pascal Jones, 1335 Longwood Park. Um, I agree with the planning. They voted no for a reason. I think we need to stop expanding. We can't afford it. Um, you probably already your packet. Um, the plan of service say police going to need more, more officers to cover that. And police is not even at capacity now, at full capacity. Um, so why don't we start by catching up um, and get everything straight up and stop stretching our people, stretching our police, stretching our fire? Um, the idea of putting a emergency exit to a school um, sounds kind of bad. And uh, I would like to remind you that this idea got presented to you, at least somewhere there, maybe not uh, Eileen, I don't think you were there, but um, to get a uh, crash gate to, uh, that was on a wing song development. Uh, to uh, get this kind of emergency exit and uh, this idea was pushed down by the council at that time to keep open. So people are going to use that exit. Um, it's okay to say no, guys. Uh, we need to start taking care of our people and say no. Um, you can stop it right there or push it to the council in January. If you push it, you know already I'm going to vote. That's not going to be a surprise. I'm going to vote no on that. Um, the other point uh, is about the charters, uh, bringing the charters for a change. And I think we should look at more than just that part. Because uh, I read the charter again today, and there's probably things we, we can change and make more current to uh, give us more leeway on what we could do. Uh, as decision making to make you know our people life better so um we can uh Susan, i will shoot you an email with what i picked up in it and if that could be presented in january that would be great i appreciate your time thank you Anyone else wishing to address the council? There, council. I'm Doug Stenson. I live on Lorraine Drive. This Laurel Wood proposal, I just I'd like to know how many more of these townhouses and apartments and things we're going to put up every time a piece of property comes up for sale. Now, <clears throat> I'm 84 years old. I've lived there 60 years. And it's always been a nice neighborhood. Now they're proposing to cut a street in there and put up no telling how many townhomes. Uh, and uh, right, me and my wife try to back out of the driveway. What's going to happen? They're talking about cutting the street from the end of Lorraine Drive to Driver's Lane, I believe. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I don't know all the details of it, but I do know that uh, these townhomes have just about took this town. And I appreciate if y'all would see fit not to approve that Laura Wood project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tinson. Is there anyone else? If not, public recognition is now closed. Uh, we'll move on to our mayor's comments. Thank you, Councilwoman George. I do have several things, first of all. If anyone was out driving within the last hour or so and want to know what all the buses and police cars were, that was the annual caravan for Christmas with kids. They fed a whole bunch of kiddos at the Civic Center tonight. How many, David Brown? 
600 at the Civic Center and then transported them to Walmart to go Christmas shopping. So quite the production happening here in our community. Um, I do want to say a big thank you to the Galton Chamber and all the departments of the city that helped support the Christmas parade this last Saturday and several of the departments with the city who also participated in the parade. That was a lot of fun. Um, we didn't get rained on until the very end, so it was fabulous. But the chamber, a whole lot of volunteers and um, participants put a lot of um, time and effort into that. I also want to give a special shout out to Hagenese. Every single year, that business produces a Macy's Day <laughs> worthy float. And um, in talking to him this year, I said, who's the creative? And he's like, me. And, and, but apparently they have a lot of folks who have actually retired from Hagenese that come back and work on that. Um, so cool. I just want to say how appreciative I am for them for going to the effort that they do each year because truly their float is what so many people look forward to in our community. I love the fact that we do still have a hometown Christmas parade, and it's fabulous, and we have a lot of participants. Even this year, they had a lot drop out because um, – the flu and weather fears, but um, the flu is certainly understandable, and we escape the weather fears. Um, also, I want to mention that um, today the Gallatin Police Department did something really special. There's a young man named DJ Daniel. You may have seen him on social media. He's being sworn in. He's a huge fan of police officers. His whole family is. He has two siblings, both of whom also want to be police officers. But this young man has had significant health challenges. He, his father, and his siblings were all at the Gallatin Police Department today, and our Gallatin Police Department did swear in DJ Daniels as a police officer. Um, he gave us all quite the lecture, and, and the women hugs, and he loves to rub bald heads for good luck. So if you run into him, watch out. Um, but just a, a really special young man. I think he was very bolstering for our police department and certainly helped um, give a special gift to all of us who got to be there. Um, this Saturday is Wreaths Across America, happening at the Galton City Cemetery at 11 a.m. Um, this is probably my favorite. I may say that about more than one, but right now this is yeah. my favorite event of the year. It's where the um, wreaths are placed on the more than 600 veterans who are buried in our Gallatin City Cemetery. It's a short service. You can participate in the wreath laying or not. Um, but I guarantee you, if you attend the service, you will be glad that you did. And so I hope that you will come out and, and watch the very short, or participate in the very short service and help lay wreaths if you wish, but certainly to be there and see what it's all about. This will be happening all across the country at the same time at cemeteries, actually around the world, um, in some foreign mm -hmm. locations as well. So it's a special thing that started many before my time, and I'm just so grateful that it still continues. Um, this, um, I think tomorrow, the Gallatin Police Department is going to be doing their veterans giveaway to veterans at the Veterans Home on Southwater Avenue. So thank you to the Gallatin Police Department for doing that. I do want to let this council know that Jennifer Lefevre has accepted the CIO position with the city of Gallatin, and she'll be starting in January. We'll look forward to that. She said she is ready to hit the ground running. And then I think that leads me to my final comment, unless I've forgotten something that this will be Lori Smiley's last meeting as our CIO. So mm -hmm. uh, did you just say we don't have a meeting next week? Yeah, Lori, this is your last meeting. Did you want us did you want to say anything? <laughs> well, I will. I am most grateful for um the great strides that she has led us through in technology. Um the city, like many, were kind of late adopters of technology and I think we have come decades in the last less than a decade that you've been here so I thank you for your service and certainly the department that you've built and um, the people that you work with who are so invested and have helped put together a really fabulous technology system for our city uh oh she's feeling forced <laughs> I just want to say um thank you for all the support and um that we've, you know, you've shown me over the years. I remember when I first came in and did the IT assessment and um, was talking about Microsoft licensing and how much, you know, we needed to get in in step with it. And I remember uh, Mr. Mayberry at the time saying to me, well, um, I had three options and 
the third option, which was, you know, the most expensive, was $500,000 over three years. And he said, well, which one do you want? And I said, I want the third option. He said, okay, motion to approve. I mean, it was, and and that really, with looking back now, he, he was so conservative with money and he was so, you know, it just, it, that's how this started and you all have continued that through the years. So um, can't thank the department heads enough. They've supported me through the years. And although we've, you know, had to agree to disagree a lot, we kept working together. Um, the staff that I have is, I'm leaving in good hands. So um, I have all, um, all the confidence in the world that they will continue on. And I'm looking forward to having uh, Jennifer join in and I'll come back a little bit um, to help her out and transition to her. So I just appreciate everything and all the support that I've received. So it's been a great eight years and one of the best moves in my life when I moved up here to take this position. Oh, that's Thank you. sweet. We'll miss you, you. you have taught us and guided us well and um, for this council's and the department, I think I told the department heads today, but we'll be having a little gathering for Lori, and when we decide, I told you this weekend, <laughs> whenever we decide upon a date, and I'll let you know about that, because I would love for you all to attend as well. Um, I'll let you know about that, but um, gonna, gonna miss her. We will be having a reception on January 3rd prior to the meeting from 5 to 6 for our outgoing council members, mm -hmm. and that would be all of my comments, I do believe, this evening. Be in these chambers? Pardon me? In these chambers from five to six? Oh, we'll have it in the lobby outside. Lobby, okay. um, I did mark some events. I want to make sure I mentioned. Oh, Councilman Alexander's birthday on the 18th. The chamber's having a drop-in breakfast um, at the gathering place on the 20th. Mm -hmm. um, a reminder to council that the employee luncheon is this Friday. And I mentioned a reception. That's it. And this might be our last meeting? It's our last meeting. For this year. For this year. For this year, yes. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so uh, let us move on to the agenda. Ordinance number 02212-66. Chief Bandy. Yes, uh, this is the ask for $36,943.33 from a damaged vehicle insurance uh, reimbursement. Second. Second. I have a motion by... Um, Mr. Finnell, and second by Councilman Alexander. And any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Oh, you can stay on for number two. Ordinance number 02212-67. Chief Bandy. Yes, this is a uh, sale of surplus property for uh, sold vehicles on Gov deals, uh, $58,675. Uh, Motion to send all. Thank you. Motion by uh, Councilman Fennell, second by Councilman Alexander. Any discussion? Seeing none, it's all in favor? Uh. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimous. Thank you. Accord. It's 02212-69. Good evening, Council. <clears throat> Bill McCord, City Planner. We had several items tonight, and uh, these items were heard by the Planning Commission uh, previously and mostly at the November meeting. And there we go. Well, trying to work on it normally does. No, it's not registering. Okay. You just advance it yourself. Do you want me to hang here? Uh, I think I can do it. Be kind of awkward, but I'll make do. Okay, uh, this first item tonight is a request for a preliminary master development plan for Primrose Daycare Center, and this would be located on the east side of Greenlee Boulevard, 
a little bit north of the new Dollar General store, north of uh, Highway 386, and uh, at the point, but as shown on the screen, uh, the applicant is intending to build a 13,000 square foot uh, <laughs> building, 13,500 square foot building on the just under four acre parcel. It would contain, uh, of course, the child care center and accessory uh, outdoor play area. And then they'll also have parking in the front and an interconnected parking lot with the vacant parcel, currently vacant parcel to the north. This property is zoned PGC, so this use is a permitted use in that district. Uh, it would not provide a connection to the vacant property to the south because there is a small creek there and uh, they would not be crossing that creek. Of course, the parking would be in front of the building and they would meet landscaping buffer requirements. Planning Commission reviewed this request at their November meeting and voted six to zero to recommend approval of this master plan. To approve. The motion by Councilman, who is it? Alexander? Sorry. I'll second it. Second by Councilwoman Love. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Vote again. Ordinance number 02212 70. Okay, the next item is a request for a preliminary master development plan on a 31 acre parcel or 31 and a half acre parcel of land located east of Big Station Camp Boulevard on the south side of Vietnam Vets uh, Boulevard and north of the CSX Railroad. The eastern portion of the property contains a substation. I think many of you might be familiar with that. <coughs> Property is being used now. Uh, last few years, where they've been placing field dirt on the property, particularly on the western end of it. Previously, the property was approved for a mini warehouse storage facility. That master plan had expired, and the applicant now is proposing a new master development plan that comprises of multiple uses, including eight lots. Uh, eight lots, uh, eight open space tracks, and a new public ro roadway that will extend from Big Station Camp Boulevard just to the north side of the railroad track. Now, where, what you're looking at here is a uh, rendering of the plan that, that shows uh, Big Station Camp Boulevard on the left side of the plan. So north is kind of off to the upper right-hand corner of the, of the image that you're seeing. What they intend to do is build a large um, use recreation, indoor recreation facility on the, the south central portion of the property with accessory parking. And then there would also be uh, a variety of uses, including restaurants, convenience store, a hotel, uh, storage facilities, including many storage facilities. And then uh, the roadway would extend back to and provide access to the existing substation. They would, of course, be providing accessory parking. In a couple small areas, they would request uh, alternative buffer yards because of the unusual shape of the property and slopes. And most of those interior buffer yards would be uh, between the streets and the parking areas. Is it better little rendering of this shows you the location, a little more discernible of, of the buildings and the road and parking area. Uh, the hotel would be backing up to Highway 386. Convenience store use would be on the corner of Big Station Camp Boulevard and the new street that they would uh, construct. And you can see the larger building, which would be the recreation facility, would back on the south, the west portion of the property, uh, mm -hmm. parallel to the railroad tracks. And there would be other commercial and restaurant uses uh, in the interior of the property. So this would be a private 
uh, recreation facility that would uh, cater to a number of sporting activities and it's not just one activity. So it would be a draw, not just for the community, but regionally. Uh, this is a rendering of what some of the commercial buildings, including the hotel, would look like. So you know, I think you're quite familiar with typically these types of structures which are commonly built uh, in city of Gallatin now to comply with our land development regulations and architectural study. And this would be the uh, indoor multi-use recreation facility and other commercial activities that could be built on these properties. <clears throat> the Planning Commission did review this and discussed uh, at length. Uh, multiple uses would comprise Again, 11 buildings and 321,000 square feet. Of course, the largest being the recreation facility. The Planning Commission, after reviewing comment, uh, voted six to zero unanimously to recommend approval on this master development plan. The applicants are in the audience and uh, they can probably provide you a lot more detail uh, if you have questions about how they're operating in their schedule of development. I just love to hear them talk about what their proposal is because I actually had calls and questions about it and I listened when it went through the planning commission, but I think it would be fun, fun and informative to hear from the representatives. I think we all enjoy it when we have something that's not apartments or townhomes. <laughs> Uh, Bill, Jim Harrison, CSDG, uh, Bill did a great job of describing the general outline of the development and what's included. Uh, sports facility is probably the biggest thing that people have an interest in. Um, and we've been working, very excited about that and very excited about the uh, flex space that they've got. They're going to have indoor basketball courts and things of that sort. There is an option that they have, and that's part of this PNVP to do an outdoor uh, turf field. We don't know whether that's going to happen for sure. Still working on that component. Very exciting use for this corner. Uh, if we did the outdoor uh, uh, flex field, we would actually just eliminate some self-storage on the backside towards the uh, the transformer station, the substation. That sounds like a potential so. condition of approval. <laughs> well, we, we don't know for sure if it can all work economically viably together. We know what's in the indoor facility can. So that's why we're proposing what we have on there right now. But we want to work to make that happen. We appreciate uh, city staff working with us. And uh, we've been, of course, coordinating with uh, Mr. Fenton's, Mr. Fenton and, and uh, Rosemary Bates as well. Uh, they're very cooperative, very helpful to try to promote this because we know this will attract a, a whole lot of folks and be a great facility for our city. So uh, just some general information. Obviously, the hotel works hand in hand with sports facility, with activities you have such as that and athletics and things that go on with that, the convenience store as well. And then we feel like the restaurants and some of the other uses around there it's, with a very nice mixed use development will really work together to be very walkable, uh, to overlap with parking needs and things like that. So just here to answer any questions that you may have. What kind of timeline are you talking? Uh, we're planning on going immediately to FMDP so we're really hoping to kick off construction within the next six months. So we would hope, uh, you know, to have buildings and everything up. I would say it'd be a year, year and a half, something like that. That's what we're hoping for. We're working for that as quickly as we can. I have a couple of questions. One of them is um, for the indoor sports facility. You mentioned basketball. What are some other examples? Well, there's, there's other types of training that go on. There's actually an opportunity with the turf fields to have indoor soccer and things like that. There's a, there's a, cut, there's a facility I did a long time ago. I won't say how many years ago because it would kind of age me. But uh, that's down in Franklin called the Forum. That's off a Gothic Court on Mallory Station Road. And that's been a great facility. I've seen everything from I don't think this is big enough to have hockey in it, so it won't quite go that far. But it does a lot of different types of flex activities where you can work on training, pitching, baseball, basketball, things of that sort. It's just a real mix of activities, and it's very flexible, the size of the facility. And so that's what's exciting about it. Exciting. My other question is about the restaurants. Are they mostly fast food drive-in, or are they sit-down 
No, we expect that they'll be mostly sit down. Uh, most sit down restaurants have, after COVID have kind of an element of drive through pickup type service anyway. Fast so, casual. Yes, <laughs> yes. So there'll be some of that. So we think there'll be. Uh, I know I was at the Chop House meeting my family the other day, and and they had you know so many parking spaces for drive up and pick up. Uh, that it was unbelievable. So I think every restaurant is kind of navigated towards operating that way a lot more. So we're going to be working hand in hand with that. It also looks like there's a lot of green space. Yes, yes, a lot of green space, uh, trying to protect green space where we can. Uh, it's got great visibility off the bypass on that interchange, which we love that. Uh, I think it'll be the architecture is nice that we have some standards as far as the PNDP. So we're just very excited about the whole thing. Thank you. In all seriousness, I don't love the storage as part of this. So if they could, <laughs> I agree with a different route. <laughs> Mayor, we understand. That. And, and actually, the storage is very intentionally put down at the low point down next to the substation. We're really trying to place it in the back as much as we can. Uh, part of the reasoning behind that, we would like to put a, a field there, and we're going to work towards everything we can to do there. We just can't guarantee it right now. We want to see the other stuff happen. So. Just working for the best we can get. So, what will be your target sport to put in that facility? It's going to be a variety. I think you'll you're going to see basketball. You're going to see soccer. You're going to see baseball. Try to promote tournaments. Uh, there will be some smaller tournaments uh, and things like that. I don't think uh, when you say tournaments, that's kind of a scary term, or it can be from a traffic standpoint. Uh, the size of the facility will constrain that to some degree. Uh, so the parking that we have around the facility is sized specifically for that, and then we'll have we know we'll have some overlap where people go to the restaurant and kind of just park there instead and kind of do that kind of thing. But um, it we will have some smaller tournaments, but they won't be large tournaments. Close nose. I don't know the answer to that question. I'll have to get that answer for you and come back at the next meeting. Who will but be what promoting, promoting them? I don't know that. I can find out. I'll find out. Jim, I, I, I called Paige the other night, and I was at a facility that you named, having grandkids in football, basketball, baseball, and traveling and cheer. I see these complexes that are being built, and some of them are quite large, and, and I, I'm really excited about it, and I see that it could service a lot of the, the needs for our community up here. Um, the other night when I called Paige, it was at maximum capacity, and it was the one I went to was in Franklin, Kentucky, near Bowling Green, and there was thousands of people there, and it was for the cheering. And then once uh, the kids come off the stage, you know, there's a whole other group of people that was pulling up to go into facility. So uh, I'm excited about that, and I think it would work at the location that you're putting it in. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions? Have we already got a motion? No. I move we send it on to council. Okay. Motion, Miss Love, sending it on, and second by uh, Councilman Fan. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. The court. Ordinance number 02212-71. Okay, this council, this next item is quest for rezoning with the master plan for Laurelwood Park. Laurelwood Park is uh, located, would be located uh, east of Southwater Avenue at the what's currently the end of Lorraine Drive. And it also would extend up to um, Driver's Lane. It's an unusual shape par parcel, as you can see there, <clears throat> comprising 23.28 acres. A portion of the property is currently zoned R15, and then a por smaller portion is zoned R10, and they're requesting the MRO zoning with a preliminary master development plan 
for mm -hmm. mostly a townhome lot subdivision. And it's kind of small scale, but it, mostly a townhome lot subdivision, but they would have four lots that would be larger, uh, standard, more standard uh, lots that are similar in size to what you have up and down Lorraine Drive that would um, be on the extreme southwest side of the development. It would include uh, an extension of Lorraine Drive and or uh, Timberwood uh, Drive where it intersects with Drivers Lane. So it would provide a through ability for trips to um, access both out to uh, either Drivers Lane where they could go uh, either north, south, east, or west from there and or out to uh, Highway 109. The applicant is looking to uh, construct with this if, if an ordinance is approved, they're looking to construct 120 uh, nine, or excuse me, I'm sorry, that's not correct. <clears throat> that 4.07 uh, units an acre, 103 units. And again, four of those would be a standard lot size and the remainder of those would be townhomes. They would be constructing public streets. They, the reason for the distribution of lots on the property is because there is both a lot of utility lines, the overhead wires that extend through portions of the property, and then there is also an intermittent creek that flows roughly from the northeast portion of the property to the southwest side of the property. So uh, the, prop the area is designated as uh, suburban in the character area map, which is part of the new comp plan. There was a lot of discussion about this development. Uh, the applicant made some design changes to accommodate some requests, including, of course, the larger lots that you see on the southwest portion. There will be um, more than half the property will be in open space, and that includes buffer yards as well as the buffers along the creek. Uh, this would be local streets. It would not be collector streets. <clears throat> the comp plan does indicate that some someday uh, if Wayne Street is extended to the east, that that could be designated as a collector street and might be the appropriate location for a future traffic signal if warranted. This location now, uh, traffic would be able to access Highway 109 at the new Nichols Lane uh, traffic signal as well. The Planning Commission did discuss in detail a lot of the ramifications and so forth of this plan and then voted uh, by a 4-2 vote to recommend approval of this rezoning and master development plan. The, um, that would show you a better rendering of the location of the lots and the phasing that they're proposing to do in the development. Of course, phase two would be on the east side. <clears throat> This would be a rendering of the townhome units and they would meet the brick and stone requirements of, of the code. And that's a color rendering of those units. Back up. Mr. McCord, can you show us where the four homes are? Uh, we have, doesn't work on the screen, so I'll approach the screen. Uh, the four that he's going to be the four homes, ninety-eight townhouses. The larger lots and the four right here on the western end, which is adjacent to Lorraine Drive, where the single family homes currently are. If you head east and north, you have townhouses. Be, be simple, platted lots. The applicant is in the uh, audience tonight and might want to add some additional information about this. I think that would be good. Can we hear from the applicant? Heather, Cal Gentry with Civil Land Company. Uh, I'm here to discuss the Laurelwood Park development. It's a residential development southeast of the new Publix on 109. Um, the main entrance for the community will come off Drivers Lane, lined up with Timberwood Drive. The original track that we were under contract to purchase is the southern, more bulky piece, and we realized that putting all of that traffic on the Lorraine was too burdensome. 
So we're acquiring that additional rectangular piece northbound, and, and it's mostly road through there in order to give a main entrance and access to the signal, the new signal at Nichols Lane. We feel it'll take a lot of the burden off of the existing neighborhood. Um, the development as proposed provides extensions to the long range transportation plan, taking Timberwood north south and then allowing for Plain Drive or Lorraine to go east west into that undeveloped track to the east. Um, we do meet, as Bill said, meet the guidelines of Plan Gallatin. Uh, I know this area is indicated up to five units per acre, and we're right at four. And the land both east and west of us um, is both indicated for up to 15 units per acre. So we feel like we're being better stewards, staying off the creeks, leaving a lot of green space, over 50% uh, undeveloped on this track. I'm sorry, did you say 50%? Yes, ma'am. Um, working, as Bill said, we worked with the Planning Commission um, to try to ease some of the pressure on the Lorraine Drive access point. Uh, we did remove quite a few townhomes and replace those with single family lots, and those lots are the average between the R15 zone and the MRO zone we're asking for, so it should be a good transitional use. We had a divided median connection there to try to slow traffic, and we're installing a raised uh, crosswalk, which makes it very, you have to go very slow over it to, uh, to get over the top of it into that section of the neighborhood. All of those things to reduce the number of cars that will go that way because we want them to go driver's lane to the signal, and then also to make sure they're going extremely slow when they move through there. Uh, we also have agreed to work with engineering for any other traffic controlling or uh, other things that they want in any of the adjoining neighborhoods to try to reduce the flow or reduce the speed. Um, Are there only one car garages? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I have a quick question. You just mentioned that you had lowered the number. How many units did you lower that by? Um, we originally, I believe, had 108 units proposed for the whole development, and now we're at 102, but four of those are the single family, so we reduced by 10 townhomes. Reduced by 10 townhomes, but added in for single, single family. family homes. Yes, ma'am. So reduced it by six. What about overflow parking? We've provided parking internally for visitors and whatnot. Um, they do all have, uh, the driveways are long enough to hold a vehicle, the garages are large enough to hold a vehicle, and then we have extra parking spaces scattered throughout the development for visitors. You know how many extra parking, pla parking places you have there in the building? Mr. Fan, I can look real quick. Um, I think it's in the range of a dozen or so, plus or minus, between 12, 15, somewhere in that range. This isn't a question, but an observation. I drove down Driver's Lane, and that's another narrow country road, and I personally don't feel like townhouses fit in with that area. Understand, yes, ma'am. Our traffic, we are, we do have a traffic study underway, and if we need to make some improvements to driver's lane, we will be doing those. Bill, what was the concerns of the planning commission that uh, voted no? Well, initially, their concerns were that there was townhome developed or proposed on the uh, southwest portion adjacent to the single family home zoning on Wayne or Lorraine Drive. So that's why the applicant did go back and make some of those changes. They also dropped another unit, I think, elsewhere. Uh, they want, of course, the traffic calming is uh, an issue as well. In your agenda package, there is a uh, trip generation comparison of what types of trips and number of trips would be generated under the existing zoning if they developed a property under the existing zoning and or with a conditional use as opposed to the proposal that they have. And it's basically the same trip generation. So it's just a different, the townhome units don't generate them as many trips as a single family home does. That's why you can get more single family homes uh, comparatively with the same number of trips or excuse me, townhome units with the same number of trips. 
single family homes generate almost 10 units, 10 average daily trips a day, whereas townhome is about five and a half. Because of the size of the units, basically. How many I mean, people tend are, to live there? Those are based on long term uh, studies that have been done by Institute of Transportation Engineer, Engineers for many, many years. And that trip generation rate has really not changed much at all. Hey, that property that's uh, to the east, I guess, does that front, like, is the access to that off Odom's Bend? I'm, you know how great I am with you. It, it's a long distance way over to, to get to Odom's Bend Road. That's but what, where, where, where is the access to that property that's to the east of that? Not what we're talking about, but what lays. To, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of what does the future of that area look like, and that's why I'm trying to figure out exactly how much distance there is between there and Odom's Bend. Uh, it is designated suburban character area, and then you know, have some uh, yeah, look the future map, employment map. center character area as well, further on to the east. So um, that, that suburban would be supporting densities of uh, basically the three to five. I thought that's what you were asking about what can be developed there. Sorry. But I appreciate you. Um, well, it, um, I'll be glad to try to answer. It's vacant property now. Is that what you mean? Or like farm lands? Okay, the answer to my question would be yes. So, yeah, it looks like all that property um, between there, there's no access to it between essentially Lorraine and Odom's Bend. I was just thinking, what might somebody bring to us for Odom's Bend at some point in the future? That's what I was thinking. And talking about, of course, like what I talk about that I would like to see on Odom's Bend and how that may flow from one to the other. That was that was the pertinence of my question. It, it's it's basically agriculture and large estates. Yeah. Down there. I'm just thinking what one day it might be. So make a motion that we move this on to council. Motion to what? Send it to council. Send it to council. Okay. We have a second. I will second. Any discussion? I really don't have a, a problem sending it to council, but I, I I just I'm kind of with Linda. I just uh, I just don't feel that it's really right for the area out there. Um, will you be able to see this development? I know where Councilman Camp lives. And I think this is pretty much close to relatively where he lives, but will you be able to see this development from the new 109? I believe the topography will keep you from seeing it from 109. We do, we will have units that ride up by truck driver's lane, but I don't think you'll be able to see it from 109 just because um, the land goes up and over. But I haven't, I haven't studied that in particular and get you that answer though. You would be willing to put more houses in that area rather than uh, take some more of the townhouses out. We can review that. There's a. Um, we can review that, Mr. Fennell. And uh, Bill, we was a four-two vote, is what you said. That's correct. Is there a lot of discussion on this particular piece of property. There was, and initially it was deferred, and the redesign came back and addressed those issues. Most they make concessions. So it, it took um, two months to go through the planning commission. So the first reading would be when for the new council will be in. I'm fine with moving it on for the new council can weigh in on this also. What about the roads? Who, who's going to be responsible for these narrow roads and stuff? Is this, is that, are these county roads? Well, these no, these will be new streets that will be built to city standards. So all these are new roads are going to be built to city standards. I think so. Is he is what about well, drivers? About you said they would do improvements if required, but I don't think we that's need that's that. That's yet, right. Not the time to put pedals. 
Pardon me? I couldn't hear that. I'm sorry. I said he said that they would do um, improvements to driver's lane if required, as shown by the traffic that, That's Those I types think, of things. Are, and I'm guessing that would be between driver's lane and 109, not the whole state. So. Okay. There will be a traffic study that will be preparing, so that would identify any deficiencies in uh, area roadways. Got one more question. So you said that concessions were made at planning, and did they still, was after that, was the vote four to two? Right. Still was not. Not was unanimous. I, I think, I mean, my personal opinion, I think that's something that we need to defer on until a little later. Instead of killing it, or still extending it on, I, I would just, that's just me. I would just like to defer it and let the new council work, I mean, work on it. I didn't mean work, work on it. Can I second his deferment since I made a motion to send it to council? But when are you wanting to defer it to the next, the first work session of the new council? Okay. I think that would give more time to clear up some of the misunderstanding about it. We need to remove the initial motion. I believe that Councilman Fan, in effect, was his motion. I withdraw my motion. And the deferral takes precedence. Okay. We have now a motion and a second to defer. to defer. We have a motion to defer by Councilman Alexander, second by Councilman Fennell. Fan. Fan, sorry. Okay. Now is a discussion. Yes, now you can have this discussion on the deferral. Yes. Cal, you've always brought us some nice properties, and we've always uh, uh, done nice things in Gallatin. This one, just I just don't have that feeling right there with so many townhouses versus the housing on the property. Um, and, and I think what Councilman... Uh, John D. Alexander was trying to do is put it back and allow some of the new members to weigh in on this also and uh, to see if we could have a plan that we would all be more comfortable with. And I agree with his wisdom on that. We're happy to accept the deferral, let the new council work on it, and answer some more of the questions. Okay, thank you. So is there any further discussion? Okay, all in favor of deferring? Uh, aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, motion carries unanimously or deferring. All right, Mr. McCord again. This is the resolution number R2212-85. Hey, Council, I'm going to present these two items together, and they really do have need to go together. This is a request for an annexation and a plan of service. As you recall, we modified our annexation review process where we no longer essentially will entertain the zoning aspect of it, but I will discuss a little bit of that because that's more makes it uh, easier for y'all to make a decision as to potential impacts and of course the plan of service has to rely upon some concept plan to be able to uh, proceed with that so from that standpoint this would not be an item that you would be voting on the zoning or plan of development but simply on the annexation and plan of service and the uh, zoning would catch up later if you move forward with, with the annexation uh, you of course Got a lot of public input on this issue tonight, but the applicant is looking to annex a 77 and a half acre parcel of land on the east side of Dobbins Pike, about a half a mile north of the existing city limits, which is just north of Albert Gallatin Avenue. The property is contiguous to the city, so it is not an enclave. The city, uh, part of Triple Creek, Creek Park, property is located to the east boundary of this property, so it does provide that connect connection to the existing city boundary. 
It is located north of the middle school and the elementary school on the north side of Hicks Lane. It is across the street from uh, the Hollywood Hills, and I can't remember the uh, name of the other development there that's adjacent to Hollywood Hills. But um, and it would have um, access both to Hicks Lane near the, the middle school as well as so their primary access would be to and from um, Dobbins Pipe. This area is designated on the comp plan as suburban. So when the comp plan was recently adopted by the Planning Commission this year, earlier this year, they designated this property for a uh, suburban development pattern, which would allow up to five units per acre. Um, mostly three to five units per acre is the recommended density for properties developing in the suburb suburban character area. The applicant does intend to develop the property, uh, redevelop the property as a typical suburban type subdivision. And uh, right what you have now are properties, with the exception of the city of Gallatin on the east side, you have properties in the county that range in size from really many farms to uh, ranchettes and small lots. There is a large uh, tower and you see that on this rendering here which shows that circle area and that's the fall zone of the tower. So there's a communications tower there that uh, they would not use obviously for development of the subdivision but it would be contained within an open space area. Oh, see that one? The lots would be laid out in this configuration. So what you see off of Dobbins Pike is a road that would be constructed kind of in the high point of Dobbins Pike to maximize sight distance along that road. And it would be a, a median that would provide for multi, two ways in and out of uh, the subdivision to the first intersection. And as you can see, they would uh, retain a creek that extends through the middle of the property, and that would be all contained in open space. Everything you see in the green would be open space. Uh, stormwater ponds in the darker green or aqua color. Um, so a lot of the trees that you see out there, particularly along the buffer zones and especially along the creek, would be retained. And uh, so those major trees uh, and heritage-type trees where those would be located would be kept. Uh, the road network would interconnect and intersect there with the private road in Hicks Lane, the private road that serves the middle school, and Hicks Lane intersect. So there won't be a direct access uh, only to Hicks Lane. Uh, the applicant is here tonight and will be able to describe in more detail their negotiations with the school board on how that roadway could operate. So the uh, interconnected street pattern would allow for uh, at least two access points to and from, and then so if, if potentially uh, in the future, uh, an access up to the north if that property sells or redevelops. Of course, you can see the tower location in the northeast corner would all be left as in, within the open space tracks. So they're proposing 193 lots with this proposed development, uh, again, I want to emphasize that you were not to consider not be uh, moving a zoning action forward. This would only be an annexation action. We are prepared a plan of service, which is included in your agenda package, which evaluates the potential impact. All infrastructure would be constructed by the developer at the developer's expense, and then it would be just like other subdivisions and developments in the city would then be uh, after construction and a time after construction before everything is finally eligible for accept acceptance by the city would all be, uh, again, maintained by the developer. Um, the Planning Commission did review this request, and that took place in July. And the Planning Commission uh, had five members present at that meeting, and it was a 3-2 vote not to recommend the annexation and plan of service. Uh, I think some of the reasons that they, what they were saying is that uh, the density, the unsurety of Hicks Lane and the impacts to Hicks Lane and the unsurety of being able to 
move traffic uh, on the private road that serves the middle school and uh, that this density was a little higher density than what you have in this area. Although I do want to point out that right across the street on Dobbins Pike, you have Hollywood Hills and that other development, which is a similar, even more dense than this area would be. So um, those were the basic issues of concern. I feel kind of like Hicks Lane is going to give us the same kind of a problem is Berry Lane or Douglas, was it Douglas Road that we were, we had so much discussion about a small little country road with, that's that narrow. Um, and again, 100 and, 193 units on uh, that coming out. I know that's just a, an emergency, but somebody mentioned that, you know, if it's open, it, people are going to use it, whether it's in four emergencies or not. Um, I don't really like the fact that it's, that those school buses have a hard time going back and forth and the traffic is bad in the mornings. Dobbins Pike is bad in the morning and in the afternoons. I sometimes go over that way you know, cutting up through uh, Albert Galton, and I see the traffic is really intense in that area. And uh, I feel kind of, I love the green space. I like that, that there's so much green space. I don't like 193 units coming in and out on those roads, though. I think maybe, maybe we'll want to listen to the developer. Uh, I'll be pretty brief because uh, I think uh, there have been some questions and uh, Ms. Love brought up some questions that we need to more thoroughly address. Um, and it's going to be hard for me to do that without showing some exhibits. And, and we've done a traffic study. Uh, we've looked at this very carefully with a lot of folks. But tonight I'm just going to ask that we just defer this. Let me pull those exhibits together so I can answer y'all's questions. I've been back listening to... The neighbors, we want to be good neighbors. Um, we want to do the right thing. Uh, we do like this development. We do like the open space. Uh, we do like the fit for the area. Uh, we like walkability to uh, parkland, which the city owns and is adjacent and contiguous on the east side. We like all that, but uh, but I, I need to get some better exhibits back to kind of explain some things. I'm not going to be able to talk it through with the words, so I'd, I'd like to ask that we just, uh, if y'all could defer this tonight. I appreciate it. Can I ask one question just yes. to satisfy Absolutely. my curiosity? Um, what kind of homes do you envision for the property? We've got in the P the PMDP, we've got uh, homes. That, uh, Ryan Homes was the builder that was looking at it at the pa in the past. It's it's actually, I think, uh, the pattern book has that on there. They've got a mixture of brick and stone on the front. Uh, they're very nice homes. E each one of these homes... The way this is laid out has open space in the backyard for most of them, about 80% of them. So it's kind of like they got a park in their backyard, but they've got a smaller lot to maintain. The other thing that we've preserved, not trying to get off the home conversation, but uh, we've preserved a cemetery that's in the middle of the site. And that's where the Myers name comes from is, is uh, some of the family. You gotta have to do that. Well, we need to do that. We don't always embrace the legacy. <clears throat> we, want to, we want to embrace that and preserve the heritage as much as we can. Um, not holding you to it because I know it could change at any point. What in in today's market? What do you think the price point might be on those? Oh man, I don't. <laughs> uh, that's that's way outside of my okay you range. Don't. But I, I I don't know. I, I think they're. I, I don't know. I, I I'd have to ask. But I'll what square that. footage will they be? They're they're in the neighborhood of two thousand square feet. Roughly something like that. They're about four hundred thousand. That's what I was going to say. Be single family home neighborhoods. I was just curious what kind yeah. of prices we might be looking at there. Four hundred. And great market. walkable access to the school, walkable access to the parkland on the east. I, I think there's, but there are concerns that and some of the, some of them have been mentioned tonight, and I want to make sure I can show exhibits and make sure I can explain that very well, so y'all can see what it is. And I really think to do that. To try to push it through without looking at those exhibits and explain that it just does a that's not the right thing. Have you met with any of the citizens? We've we've not had a neighborhood meeting. Uh, we've uh, and, and when I show the exhibits, 
this will explain this. We have met with a couple of the neighbors around the site, but I wouldn't say we've met with every single person around the site. Motion to defer. We when need that motion, Susan. Yes. How much time would you want to defer that? Uh, if if we could just defer it for one one cycle, and I'll okay. So the first so first work session of the year. The next one. My session. motion. <laughs> okay, we have a motion by uh, Councilman Fennell to defer it to our next session, which would be January tenth. Does that sound right? Okay, and uh, second by Councilman Alexander. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I didn't sit down too long. Right. Okay. Six and seven. Okay, hey, we're into resolution number R2212 87. Can, can you all not be so noisy, please? It's kind of distracting. Thank you. Mr. McCord? Oh. oh. <laughs> uh, this one should be quite simple. Uh, applicant is requesting uh, approval of an indemnity and hold harmless agreement with a certificate of liability insurance to plant trees in the right of way of the paddock at Kennesaw Farms Phase 1. This is currently under construction. Um, many other phases in Kennesaw Farms have a similar agreement where they're planting trees. They have this one, exactly. We have a motion by Councilman Fennell, counted by, uh, second by Councilman Alexander. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Blood. Hey. Resolution R2212-84. Yeah, I'm seeking to prove the supervisor position to a higher grade. And this is due to currently, we have a position called Mechanic 3, which reports to the supervisor, and they're in the same grade. Motion by Second. Thank you. Motion by Councilman Fennell, second by Councilman Alexander. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Stewart, ordinance number 02212-68. Thank you, Council. Uh, Governor Stewart, building official. This is an ordinance uh, waiving certain construction related fees for the Sumner County Courthouse and parking garage. This is plan review fees and building permit fees. No inspection fees, no subcontractor fees. Just the plan review and the uh, and the building permit. And oh, 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 oh. oh, no, 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 no. I'm about to say that I think maybe the mayor and the attorney would like to speak on this. Yes. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I do, in, in looking at it, I had a phone call from the county mayor um, I think they want in writing that we are committed versus me keep telling them we're going to do what we said we would do. And so Susan reworked these today, divided into a resolution and an ordinance just to make clear what we agree that our commitment is. And then in the um, ordinance would be the waiving of the fees. Um, Susan, and I agree with this, and I appreciate her suggesting this, um, so suggested the resolution because that way it would only have to pass one reading because, unfortunately, he keeps pushing bringing this to a meeting until he is, per, you know, satisfied with what the city's doing. So this resolution will just make us have to go to one reading in January. The ordinance will go through two on the waiving of the fees. But And I do have, um, if Ms. Smiley can assist me, well, I guess we can take the ordinance first because it was in the packet. And all that we did in the ordinance was we pulled out two of the whereas clauses. So the ordinance now is really just dealing with the, the waiver of the fees. 
Um, and then the resolution talks more about the, the total commitment that the city has made and is making. And it's still the same commitment that there was. Yes, the, the, the resolution spells it out a little bit more clearly, I think. And so the right now, if you'll just take up this ordinance, waiving, um, the fee. waiving the fees, the only thing that's been changed from this ordinance that was in your packet was we pulled out the um, whereas clauses dealing with the no, amounts. The, the amounts that were committed that don't deal with the fees. So now the ordinance is just dealing with the waiver of the fees. Make a motion that we approve the waiver of the fees. Got a second that. Okay, we have a motion to approve the waiver of the fee by Councilman Alexander and second by Councilman Finnell. And I do also want to, I think it's spelled out clearly clearly in the ordinance, but I want everyone to understand these are the fees that are waived to date. And there could be additional fees if Sumner County or the general contractor um, has additional additional fees. It does not, and Chuck, correct me if I'm, if I'm right about this or wrong, uh, we are not waiving anything for subcontractors. Nothing for subcontractors and nothing for inspections. It also does not include the jail pod. That continues to be um, a discussion between the city and the county. And to be clear, I, th I, th I think we are contributing a tremendous amount because this has been so much work for our codes department. Um, and, you know, and the fire only <laughs> escalated how much work it is for our codes department. Um, but, you know, they so continue we'll to um, ask for more and more. And I think that this is probably the limit of what we might be able to do. And it is substantial. Um, with us waiving all of these fees. When they first asked for the $3 million, the waiving of fees was not a discussion, was not an ask. So this is beyond that, and it's probably going to wind up being many, many hundreds of thousands of dollars, yeah. probably in excess of a million. Uh, it's going to have to go up. But uh, as our discussion this morning in department head meetings, this, uh, without the parking garage, the courthouse is a white elephant down there. They can't see it because they can't meet the city ordinances for parking without it. So it behooves the city to try to work this out for us to work, have a parking garage at, for the courthouse and for the citizens of the city. And we were, at, at, and to be clear, this discussion about the waiving of fees did happen quite some time ago. I mean, back last summer maybe. And, and um, Mr. Stewart and, and some, um, I think Councilman Overton was there. And I was there and some commissioners and stuff when we talked about it. But we did say at the time that it would have to go to council for approval, but we haven't ever done it. So that's why we're doing it. Um, and then the resolution explains that our initial commitment was the 1.8 for the um, courthouse, um, the garage. 1.8 for the garage and then 1.2 for the Smith Street. Of course, that 1.2 is going to go up for Smith Street. Um, and it also articulates that we had articulated, uh, I mean, that we had appropriated 1.2 to date for the, uh, no, 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 no. The 1 million that we had appropriated, $1 million for the widening of Smith Street, and we had appropriated 1.5 for the garage. That was in the bond that we issued several years ago. And our thought was that we would budget for that from the general fund when we get to the point that we're actually using that money. So that's, and that's caused some confusion both internally and externally because we had an appropriation of a different amount than what our total commitment was. And so it's kind of spelled out in here. I think it makes it clear. Um, and you've also appropriated an additional 600000 for cost overruns. If there are cost overruns. And that was um, what we did back last fall some point. Um, so we've already done that, and they have that. So, so the, the total commitment to date, it's set out in the resolution, is $4,700,000, that the city is committed to. So this is our financial commitment, and then there's another paragraph that says that we are going to partner with the county uh, to assist them to see the fruition of the completion of the courthouse and parking garage, just so they know we are partnering with them. We want this to happen. We're financially committed and 
committed otherwise. And that, that $4 million is our initial commitment, the additional 600 if there is a cost overrun, and the fees that we have waived to date. That's where that number comes from. Can we not put a cap? I'm sorry. $4,000,000. $4,007,235.50. And it's in the resolution I've handed out to you and that was on, on the screen. And it, I'm sorry, if you look in the whereas clauses and you add all those numbers up, that's where that number comes from. On those fees, can we not just put a cap on that and say we're, that we're going to a, a waive this amount of fees at this time? No, ma'am, because we'll keep adding fees in when they call us back out there for other things. So it's a, it's a running total that uh, it's so much per inspection. And there's a lot of parts and pieces that's still not there yet. You look at the building, you think that building's a long way? It's not. It's a lot more work in that building. There's a lot of fire, low voltage, alarms, securities. There's a lot of stuff still going on down there. Can't say we only waive up to a certain amount. amount. Yes. So we're, what, we, what we're waiving here is fee, the plan review fees and the building permit fees. That's just. We will still be realizing the Got some dedicated contractors and stuff. Oh, yeah. How many people have you got dedicated to it? I got four people handling it. They're down there every day. Yeah. Not there all day, but they're there every day. And then, as I pointed back here to the chief, he's got some investment there too now. I, I would like to uh, vote on these separately, vote on the waiver of fees, the ordinance waiving the fees first, and then uh, the resolution stating Gallatin's commitment. Okay, well, we already have that in discussion. We have, and now, we can vote on that. Yes. Okay. Uh, so is there any further discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. This is just moving it to council. Yes. Any opposed? Okay, moves on. And now for the resolution and its resolution number R2301-1. I don't know if Lori can get that back on the screen, but you also have that in front of you. And that's just setting out Gallatin's commitment. Which we've already discussed. And yes. Nothing's added. Okay, so do we have a motion? Motion approved. Second. Okay, we have a motion to move that on to council also, correct? Correct. Okay, that is by Councilman Alexander, second by Councilman uh, Purnell. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, that's moved on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item number 11, Ms. McCauley. Okay, so tonight we were going to discuss amending ordinance 02205-20 related to alcoholic beverages. And this stemmed from last week's meeting. Um, we are... Um, we were approving a certificate of compliance, and you wanted someone to appear, and they were not here, so we're having a special called meeting. We're not going to get into that certificate of compliance, but based on that conversation last week, you wanted to make a few amendments, and I'm not certain exactly what all you want to amend, but um, I think what you were looking at was basically in section 3-52 of the code. And it would be in subsection E. Right now it says city council may require an applicant for a retail liquor certificate of compliance to appear before the council to address any matter related to the applicant's application and or business. Um, city council may also request that the applicant furnish additional information regarding the applicant's application and or business. And what I, what I think you want it to say, and I, I don't know for certain because I didn't get a lot of uh, a feedback, but I think what you want it to say and what I would propose is that we change that subsection E to say all applicants for a retail liquor certificate of compliance shall appear before the council to address any matter related to the applicant's application and or business, and city council may request 
and the applicant may furnish additional information regarding the application and or business. I think that's what you want to change. Also in subsection B, there is a typo because it says that we, that city council shall approve the issuance of any retail liquor certificate of compliance to an applicant who has satisfied the requirements for such certificate set forth in TCA 57-3-208 and this article subject to section 3-54 and that should be 3-55. So I know that also needs to be changed. And I think there may be... I just have one thing that I want to offer to this council. <laughs> I brought this up a couple of times. And since that time, I've had an absent council member, Councilman Hayes, bring it up to me. Um, I, and actually, I think actually, well, no, I'll tell you, it was an audience member who first brought it up to me. But um, certainly, Lori Smiley and I have discussed it, that it really makes sense to measure that radius by a mile because when new roads get built, that distance changes, and that is just going to be a nightmare to figure out over a long period of time. So that's my my suggestion. Um, Councilman Hayes apparently is supportive of that at this point. I would just bring it to this council. Again. Paige, I, I am also, I, I had somebody sent me a mappage of what the effect of the radius versus a straight line. Um, I have abstained through this whole thing, but... Um, I do feel, after looking at this, I think we'd be better in ourselves if we went to a radius of what you're suggesting in Councilman Hayes. Just otherwise, we'd have to keep track of what roads were built when and how the distance changed and who was okay. And I mean, I just mm -hmm. think the radius is the safe way to go. That's fine with me. And that is in Section 3-55, Subsection B. And so I think what you're wanting to, right now it says located within one mile of an existing retail liquor store, such dis distance to be measured by the shortest drivable, drivable route. And I think what you're saying is you want it a one mile radius and to come up with langu language for that. Is that correct? And Ms. Smiley's coming forward. I would just ask that, um, and it's this sounds crazy, but we actually have one that is, what, 12 feet um, out, you know, within that radius. So the question would be, is that like a, um, a center point, point of the parcel or the front door, a mile of the front door? I mean, they are... I don't think it can be a front door because in a lot of cases, a front door won't be established yet when someone comes with a certificate of compliance. Right. So the driveway, you know, off the road, the main, where the main driveway would be. I mean, I know that sounds crazy, but we actually... How about edge of property line? Which edge? Oh, well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Dang. Typically, it is or, measured from door to door. That's the way it has always been in the past. Or the parking space. But then we should tell the them it has to be from door to door. And at this point, the front door has to be, you know. They have to establish, you know, on the on the um, parcel where that building, they expect that building to be. I don't know, Bill, if that can be. They have to define that before it gets approved. I don't know. It just... We're that close. <laughs> I think it should be from the front door. That's my opinion. And while while we're on, while we're on the subject, if I can just do a little bit before we move on re-education about the certificate of compliance, I just want to remind this council, and I know we have a special called meeting after this, um, but if you look at three fifty five location restriction on on retail liquor stores. Those are the things that an applicant has to meet. And if they meet those things, the city is required by law, unless they don't meet something in A, B, or C, to issue that certificate of compliance. We're not issuing, we're not issuing them the license. They go to the state for the license. This is just the certificate of compliance. So I just want to make that clear. I think there was a little bit of confusion last week. I just want to clarify that. It actually almost conflicts with us requiring them to be here, but I also think... Well, but there are some things that... Yeah. Because in C, there is a, a traffic issue. We might need to know how big it's going to be, what how much traffic it's going to generate. There are some, some issues that you may want to ask them about. Anybody have any questions? I think there are three things that you are directing me to draft an ordinance to correct. Is that accurate? 
to change these things like the radius instead of the point of mileage, does that affect? It will not affect is? anybody that has, it will not affect Sorry. anyone that is currently, currently has their certificate for anyone like tonight does not affect them. It was, this will be moving forward. I do think that they should be there to speak instead of May. <coughs> Yes, I agree. Okay, so I, I just need a motion to move it to council, and I will draft and put it in your agenda packet. An motion ordinance to move amending. To council. Okay, we have a motion by Councilman Alexander, second by Councilwoman Love, to move it to council. That's all three. All three. Yeah. All right. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Abstaining. Okay, so we have um, one, two, three, four, four. Well, yes, and one abstain. Thank you. Okay, so now we are going into other business. Any nope, other? No, 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 no. Number twelve. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. We have Charter Article Three, Section One. Ms. McCauley. Yes. I am handing out to you a proposed ordinance. So last week during our uh, council meeting, we discussed under other business uh, a potential need to amend our charter. As you will recall, currently in our charter, in our charter, Article 3, Section 1, do you have that pulled up, Lori? Thank you. Um, there is a, currently a section that reads, let me try to find it. Neither the mayor nor members of the city council shall hold any other elective or appointed public office except for that of notary public or be otherwise employed by the city of Gallatin. If the mayor or any member of the city council shall accept employment with the city of Gallatin or any other elective or appointed public office, his or her seat on the council shall become vacant and must be filled as set forth in this charter. And you will recall that the discussion centered around what is a public office? And I explained to you that a public office is defined by law as um, an office that is compensated, that is for a definite period of time, and that is set by statute. And so there um, was some discussion about what do we want to do moving forward. And my suggestion was that we take out the appointed office. And I do want to say, I've had some questions this week. Well, we just discovered that somebody was on the resource authority. How did we just discover that? No, we didn't just discover that. That has been approved by this body since that um, commission was in effect. There are three county commissioners that serve on that body. There is one person from Hendersville Boma that serves on that body. And it's always been that one person from City of Gallatin governing body has served on, on that. Then there was... Um, you know, some, some other, so I'm just saying there are, um, there is someone that's from our council, Mr. Hayes, Councilman Hayes is on, well, he's not now, he has resigned, but he was on the resource authority and he resigned because it was very close whether or not it's a public office. Um, it's not, the, their duties are not set by statute, but they're defined by law. And so he believed that the right thing to do was to resign from that board, and it's my understanding he has done that. And I know that Mr. Fennell found out through the process that he was on um, a, a board that the county commission or that the county mayor had appointed him to. I think you have requested, you announced I, last night. I never week. went to a meet. I didn't even know I was on the board. Right, you, you advised last night that, I mean, last week that you requested your name be removed from that, that you hadn't accepted that position. And then we had Mr. Jovance, who has just been elected, who um, is has been appointed to the airport authority. And by the legal definition, that does not meet public office. And so there's a lot of confusion about what constitutes an appointed public office. So it is my suggestion and recommendation that we just remove that from our charter. Just remove it. Uh, I think the council's indicated last week they would like to keep uh, the elective part in there that you don't want people 
to serve on this uh, city council and have another elected public office. And so I have drafted this ordinance um, that is, I think it, Lori can bring that back up for me, please. Um, that does simply that. If you just, you just if you can go straight to the um, be it ordained section, all we're doing is taking out or appointed and notary public so that it's still going to read. Finally, if you make this move, it will read, neither the mayor nor members of the city council shall hold any other elective public office or be otherwise employed by the city of Gallatin if the mayor or any member of the city council shall accept employment with the city of Gallatin or any other elective, elective public office, his or seat on the council, on the city council, shall become vacant and must be filled as set forth in this charter. I think that would clarify for everyone um, what they can and cannot do, and it would correct um, some issues. We also have, as I advised last week, we're required by law to have someone from this body be on the planning commission, and we are required by law to have someone on the electric board. So our charter conflicts with state law. So we've got to get that straightened out. To me, this is the simplest, most straightforward way to do it. I've asked a few times, but I'll bring it up again. I really would like it to be some language that says no one should serve in a, I don't know, statutorily established role unless it's as a representative of the city of Gallatin. But you keep saying this is the right way to do it. So I think that I, I think that. that can cause some confusion now by by law. Um, this is a, you know we're kind of really taking a deep dive here. But as I told you last week, the state constitution has a provision that doesn't allow um, someone to serve in, in two offices. That's for state um, elected offices, but there's the whole, there's another area of the law that you can't serve in two incompatible offices. So it doesn't mean that you can go out and get on a board that's going to be against the city of Gallatin. You still, you take an oath to uphold the office of councilman or mayor for the city of Gallatin. You have that. to uphold that oath. And so if, if someone accepts an appointment that's incompatible, um, we can go to the attorney general and have the attorney attorney general issue an opinion, but I I don't think that we need to put that in our charter. So, Miss McCauley, so back in 2016 when I first got elected on the city council, then if I would have, uh, I could have remained on the airport authority if I would have pressed the issue. That's correct. If anyone had research the issue, but that has never, you know, that had, only accepted was, opinion. That's correct. It's even in my notebook of guidance for boards and I was trying to comply. You were trying to be co um, cooperative and compliant and I respect that. So what about being on a board in a different country for a homeowners association? I don't believe that's an appointed public office. All right. Not necessarily in this argument. And like I said, as the mayor said, uh, there was a general understanding of, of what could and couldn't happen. We had some, um, it was in the mayor's notebook as to who was to be appointed, who wasn't, and I think people just resigned. And that's been going on for way before I got here. And so we're just trying to get it straightened out and make it make sense. How long has uh, a representative been on the Resource Authority Board, for example? I think the since the inception of yeah. Resource Authority. As long as it's existed, the most we can tell. And so when, this, when, when the language was crafted, the charter probably was already, it, it was in existence, and it just didn't get fixed at that time, and no one thought about it because they were appointed from this body. And right, so it wasn't were. seen that, that it was an incompatible office. It wasn't really seen as an appointed public office because this body appointed. Yeah, I'm sure the but intent. But it, it is inconsistent with yeah. all. I'm sure the intent corrected. of the charter was not to prohibit someone serving as representative of Gallatin on any board, authority, committee, et cetera. But at any rate, this does clean it up, and I'm supportive of that. Um, I do want to ask this body about another amendment. Can we vote on oh, this? Oh, yes. First, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> is, do we have a motion? Is that? I don't think we do. Yeah, we have a motion and we have a second. No, I don't think we do. I have a motion. Motion made by 
Councilman Fennell, second by Councilman Alexander. Do we have any further discussion? And this is just to move it to council. Moving it to council. Uh, all in favor to move it to council? Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion carries it to council. Now, Mayor. Okay. Um, so for many, many years, the city of Gallatin, from the time that it was a tiny little town to the size that it is now, has had a fabulous um, judge and recorder taking care of so much of our important city business. Well, our city has grown to a pretty large size. I think we're the only city remaining in the state of Tennessee that does not require that our judge be an attorney. And um, I think it's time that we as a city change our charter so that it says that the city of Gallatin will, the Gallatin City Council will appoint a part-time attorney to serve, serve as judge and, um, and we would appoint someone to serve as a recorder for the city of Gallatin. Now it would not affect judge and recorder Kittrell because she's been reelected and it would not affect her but it would happen with the next time that we had a recorder or judge position available. Bonnie, how much, uh, when is your term over with? This, I've been sworn in for her next one yet, so four years. So I'll have four more years. Okay. So we're we talking about two positions? Yes. Okay. One would be a part-time um a part, I keep saying attorney, it would want to be an attorney serving as a part-time city judge. That's typically how it's done in cities all around us. Appointed. Uh -huh. Appointed by the mayor or appointed by the council? Appointed by the council. Okay. And then, um, and then also, I mean, within that, when we get to that, there would also probably have to be some changes to our legal department because you would have to have a clerk that helped with that in some way. I, I see restructuring happening all around when that change does happen, both in how the recording happens, how the finances happen, how the um, court happens. So, hey, we're talking about amending Article 7 and Article 10. Our charter. Of our charter. Okay. To, and it would basically be making the recorder a department head. And I don't know if Ms. Kittrell would like to speak on that at all and say whether or not you are in favor or not of this happening. Yes, I am. I think that would be a good move for us. I just think it protects us long term. Um, like I said, I think we have been so very fortunate for a lot of years because of your dedicated service. But if we at this point in time were to wind up electing, say, a city judge and recorder that has not a clue, we are too big to be the place for someone to start doing that. Ms. Kittrell's learned and grown and, and probably is ahead of so many within our state that does these things. But but your average person, your average lay person is not going to have the skills, experience, or knowledge to execute that role in a way that we want it executed. So this is something we vote on now to happen in four years? Well, what we are voting is to change charter. the charter. So. And so what I would what I would need to do between now and the next meeting is to draft an ordinance, and I haven't done that because okay. I have not had time to do that. Sure. I would draft an ordinance, and it would be in your packet for the first meeting if you move this on. And then just like um, if it gets approved, just like the other charter change, if it gets approved, we are a private act charter. So our charter amendments have to go to the le state legislature to be approved. They would approve it, and then it would have to come back to our body, and we would have to approve uh, what they did by two-thirds vote for it to take effect. To be a, an effective charter change. So we don't need a, a motion to send this on. I, I, yes, I, I would like something right now. For, for you to for just to tell me to draft something and put it on the agenda. I'll make the motion that Paige recommended. Okay, so we have a motion uh, to move it to uh, Ms. McCauley to draft an ordinance to bring to our next meeting. <clears throat> By Councilman Fennell and second by Councilman Fan. Any further discussion? Uh, I just have no. One. Four years, or four years expired, will it be two people in that position after that. Well, one? it would be one person that would be the city recorder full time, like a department head. 
And then we would have a city judge that would be a very, very limited um, person that would come in. I, I don't, Ms. Kittrell can probably answer that better because she knows how most cities work there. They would probably come in several days a month and have, hold court. And then you would have a, an appointed court clerk that would handle everything while they were not here. And so, because the state requires that every city have a, an appointed court clerk that has to have a continuing education and that type of thing. So they're up on everything. But I, I, don't, think, I don't think that the city judge would be an employee that would get our benefits and that type of thing. Because the, the part time position. going to be a very limited number of hours that someone would come in and hear those cases. Later. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? The motion carries to move to the next session. Now we can move on to other business. Anyone here from the council have anything they want to bring up? I do. Uh, this goes back to our retail liquor stores, and, and we have had, um, it's been a real learning curve since November the 1st on all of these and the changes that we've made. Uh, part of the uh, ordinance reads, reads that they are required to meet several uh, obligations for the city. They have to be in the right zoning. They have to have a, an approved lease. They also have to be within the mile radius. And so I had, on November the 1st, I had six applicants. Well, only two of those applicants have met all the requirements. The other four have not. So I guess I need to deny those because they haven't met and let those applicants know this. I don't know if I deny it or, or if this body denies it. That was one thing I was not sure about. And it's not really set on the ordinance, but what what my recommendation would be is that you name the ones, if you have the, the names of the businesses or the applicants, um, that you name those and ask that those be denied and have this council approve that denial, and then you can tell them that council has denied it. And do you have another, do you have an additional one that has come in since that time that doesn't meet that you need? have denial or is it just the four I'm right now? I'm still waiting on one of those. They are to bring me their, they brought me um, their lease, but I couldn't read it. And we're not going to run into our 60-day deadline before January 3rd. Okay. Still, yeah, we're close, but we're not there yet. We need to add something in the ordinance that it we needs We can't. To the 60 days is state law. That is state law. We cannot touch that. And I handed out you something tonight for the ones that, the three that we are, uh, we will deny. When the business name is Value and Variety Wine and Spirits, and they, their location was is 459 Airport Road, and their location does not meet the zoning requirements. They have been notified of that, and they have also been in contact with the planning department to get that changed. The next one would be... Foxland Liquor Store. It would be located at 1867 Nashville Pike, and that is a, a, a mall, strip mall that will that is, is to be built. It uh, they did not supply a provide a lease, and I do not think it will meet the mileage requirements either. Then the third one was um, Guru Krupa LLC. Golden Wine and Liquors to be located at 885 Northwater Avenue. That's where Ashley and Trixie's restaurant is and the um, market there. They would be going into the side where the restaurant is, but they do not meet the zoning requirements either. And they are the ones that are just, they are just right on the mileage also. So those three because of these, um, they do not meet the requirements, so we need to deny them. Was there a fourth? Because I thought there the was fourth six. one. Uh, no, the fourth one is okay. Because we're we're doing two, and then I have the th these three, and then the other lady is going to bring me her lease. But if she doesn't she meet, did we don't have it. another meeting before January third. It'll be more than sixty days. That's until the tenth. 
of January. She didn't apply on November 1st? On the 1st, okay. I make a motion per the request of the Connie Kitchell, the city recorder, to deny applications for 459 Airport Road, 1867 National Pike, 885 North Water Avenue. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Councilman Fennell and second by Councilwoman Love to deny those three applicants for those liquor stores that's presented by Ms. Kittrell. Kittrell, sorry. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Anyone else from the council? I have one thing. Uh, since we're talking about the charter, uh, I, it's my understanding that we cannot give a small gift to city employees, vice versa, uh, according to our charter. Oh, that's okay. According to our code, I asked Ms. McCall, Hi McCauley about that, and she said that that is not allowed. But uh, I'm just talking about giving a little gift of appreciation to an employee. And I spoke with her, and you can. Well, it, it gets into the ethic. It's, it's under our ethics. So if you are giving them um, a gift because of their actions, something they're going to do, you can't do that. If you're a friend with them and you're giving them a gift because they're your friend, you can give them a gift. But this was because of something they had done or were going to do. And so I, I think what we need to do is probably just look at our ethics, what a lot of cities have done to get to get around that. And we also have people that are routinely bringing things to the fire department and the police department and other city departments. And what we do, to, we sh everybody shares with everyone. But some cities have put a limit of you could, an employee can accept up to like $25 or a nominal amount. But I think that's something that we're going to need to probably discuss further and put on an agenda. I do think that's Definition something we need to do. Also, I'm, I'm not getting into all that. <laughs> well, I also think there, there are often times when there is an employee who has a hardship and people give them gifts, not, and it's not for something they've done, but it's not also not because they're a friend. And we don't want them to ever get into some situation where somebody can say, oh, well, they took this from thus and so. Because it happens, you know, a lot of times if there's an employee that has a hardship, community members might give something. And, mm -hmm. and so I just would like to eliminate that issue if we can in any way. So look forward to future discussions. We'll put that on the next work session. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I was hoping. I have two things, uh, unless someone else does. Anyone? Okay. Um, one is it has, I have been asked by a council member um, if um, this body would consider returning to the way that we used to do committee meetings. Um, before I was in office, the council had asked that they take turns chairing the committee meetings um, during my, I guess, it was maybe a couple of years before I was in office. So it's always been done the way that we've done it, that I've been here. But someone asked me if it, if they thought it was time that um, this body considered going back to the way that it was traditionally done all the years before that time. So I bring that to you for a question. Um, and then the second thing I just wanted to advise you of, I've also had some requests for some people that have been stuck in some seats for a very long time to have new seats. And so I'm kind of working on like a new seating chart for the first of the year. Um, and I do think that, um, I, I, I think I'm close. But anyway, uh, I, I, but when you arrive on January 3rd, go to, regardless of what nameplate may be there, you go to the seat that you've always sat in. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to uh, bring up about the um, uh, switching it around for council members uh, leading the meetings. I, since we only do it maybe twice a year that we get to do it. I know, I, I know for myself, I don't really feel comfortable in that role because I don't do it enough. So I think it would be really great if we went back to where it's done the same way every month. And, and, and um, I think tip, you know, back then, I think if the mayor could not chair a meeting, then the vice mayor did. Yes. That was kind of traditionally how it rolled. Anybody else have an opinion of that? I'm, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with what all you mentioned, Paige. I don't know what action we need to take to 
and I, I don't know if that was just a decision they made at some point. I happened to be here at the night they decided that, and I don't remember it being some big formal, but I think we probably did. I don't think it's set out in the code, but I'll, I'll have to research it. I don't think that, I don't think it's that specific in the code, but I could be wrong. I don't have it memorized. Yeah. Ah. And those are my two things. That's all for okay, me. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have anything from our department heads? Da -da -da. Before the meeting, I handed out financial reports for October and November. Um, they're on your desk. I know we've had a really long meeting and we still have another one to go. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact me in the office. I'll be glad to answer. Looks great. Rosemary Bates, EDA, Councilman Alexander. This may be the last meeting where I get to have this conversation with you. I'm shocked that you didn't call on me when I'm here. But Clearview Park, there is a public meeting scheduled for January 26, beginning at 6 p.m. at the Shalom Zone to discuss the new structure for Clearview Park. And that will be promoted in the coming uh, you know, early January, but I wanted to let you know that date and time and location, and hope to see you there. And I have reached out to Councilman-elect Carter, and I'm hoping to hear from him, to meet with him, to bring him up to speed um, as well. So, And the other is we finally got the construction plans and bid packet for the gun range, and it is out for review by all the departments, and at this point, even if they were to sign off on everything, I don't think it's wise to bid it out until uh, January. With the holidays, it just, we wouldn't get a good bid back. Might not even get a bid back at all, so. But I wanted to give you an update on that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rosemary, everything you did. Thank you, Rosemary. Anyone else? Our collective Merry Christmas. Yes, Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry now Christmas. we're going to have a motion to adjourn and then reconvene. Okay. Motion adjourn. We don't do that on what was that the beginning of the meeting? Okay. Yep, motion to adjourn. Okay. Second? Second. Okay, we have a motion by Councilman Finnell. Second by Councilman Alexander to adjourn. Uh -huh. No. Okay. Dismiss. Oh, this will be a meeting, so the mayor. Do I need to move? Let me just page chair this next meeting. Yep. Let's get a win. It shouldn't be. Oh, okay. I wouldn't get two hours. Make sure you got a full dose. <laughs> I appreciate you. Okay, we're going to call to order this special called meeting of the Galton City Council. Um, it was to immediately follow the work session. The time is 8.09 p.m. I'll ask Ms. Kitchell to call the roll, please. Vice Mayor Fennell. Here. Councilman Alexander. Here. Councilman Fan. Here. Councilwoman George. Here. Councilwoman Love. Here. And Councilman Hayes and Councilman Overton are absent, but we do have a quorum. Thank you. I will read the agenda, and then we will allow public recognition only on the agenda-related item. So the agenda is determination of counsel as to whether applicant Payalbin Patel should be granted a certificate of compliance for a retail liquor store at 1680 Nashville Pike. 
pursuant to Gallatin Municipal Code 3-52. City Council is requiring the applicant to appear before it at the special called meeting to furnish information regarding the applicant's business. Um, is there any public recognition on the agenda-related item? If so, you may come forward at this time. I think, are you guys the applicants? Do you just want to hang tight until we actually consider the item? That'd be great. Anyone else wishing to speak? Seeing no one, I will declare public recognition on the agenda related item only. Closed. And we will move to item number one, and I will introduce City Recorder Connie Kittrell. Uh, yes, Mayor, this is the applicant that has met all of the requirements that you have asked them to meet. Uh, you also have a handout on them. The corporation name is RR Gallatin Liquor Corporation. Their business name will be Metro Wine and Spirits. Their location is 1680 Nashville Pike. That was what they uh, originally uh, provided to me, but that is also another um, building that structure that will have to be built and I think maybe the um, street number may have changed we'll ask the applicant uh, the applicant is payable pay pay bin Patel they have their lease their background check their mileage and their zoning have all been approved they are here tonight so if you would like to come forward They can answer evening, any questions. Guys. Yes. Last week I couldn't make on the time. I'm, I'm apologize for that. And it worked out. Hey, there is a question. I was advised today that there may be a different address for that property, that it may be 1670 instead of 1680. Actually, I got that uh, 1680 from my architect, like uh, from Green LID. He's our civil architect, Andy Leith. So he sent me the 911 address. So it, it says 1680 on it. So that's what I put it on. And if both of you would say your names too, that way we yes, would know yes. exactly. Yes. Yes, my name is Daval Patel, and she's my wife. My name is Payal Patel, and we are from Dixon, and we are. We're going to the offline. Okay. Yeah, to this council to make a determination. We can ask questions about that. What was located there? In Kennesaw. Kennesaw. And you guys had some questions about the um, size of the um, facility, and, and there may have been some others as well, but you wish for them to be here so that you could ask questions. Um, and like Ms. Kittrell said, they do meet the qualifications. So, Is this an existing no, building? No, sir. Uh, We're going to no. build out the new one. No minimum. Build a new one. Yes, sir. We're about something when you're going into the gate of Kennesaw, it will be to the right next to the uh, and Dr. Andy Reed's the dentistry. Like it, uh, it across the like a uh, Scott. Sean, as you as you go into Kennesaw Farms, look Kennesaw Mr. Farms. Foster, Sorry. If you, Mr. If Foster, if you will uh, just state your name, so that we're Foster, recording. Thank you. I'm with uh, Southeastern Buildings Builders. So you go into Kennesaw Farms, we are right there on the right. We had sold that lot to a CVS uh, drugstore. They purchased the lot from the CVS. So as you go into Kennesaw Farms, the first lot on the right will be a new 12,000 square foot building. It looks like 9,000 square foot will be a liquor store, Class A liquor store. 3,000 will be a restaurant. Okay. So the accommodation liquor store and restaurant? Not necessarily a combination, but it's in the same building. I got you. So is it's it past wages. the entryway or? It's on? right there at the entryway. Radius. Yeah, or it wouldn't be here. Okay. Park property, everything. Good. Motion to approve by Councilman Alexander. Second. Oh. Second by Councilwoman George. Is there any further discussion or questions? Councilman Fan, did you have a, a question? You, I thought you had a question. Yeah, we don't have a square foot limit. Okay, about square foot. Okay, um, all those in favor of issuing the certificate of compliance to the bills, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. 
Connie. Um, if there is a conflict in the address, do let us know. At some Certainly. point, I don't know how we remedy that, but we'll find a way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you, Scott. Thanks. Thank you, Council. Motion to adjourn. Second. second. Motion to adjourn. Second by <laughs> Councilwoman Lover George. All in favor say aye. Aye. Everyone have a lovely evening. More importantly, have a very Merry Christmas. And we will look forward together to a happy, healthy, and prosperous 2023. We'll see you on January 3rd. Oh.